what I need is a miniature impact driver. But what I've got is an old screwdriver and a little hammer and that'll do the job. Just put plenty of torque on the screw with one hand, give it a tap with the other hand and the tap is enough to break those screws loose. That one the bush is just pushed out as I've loosened that up. So the bush is now rotating on the back side. Let's see if I can get that loose. We can get under as I could. That was it. Oh, we'll get that in a minute. Let's get these other two screws. There it is, it's fallen out now. These other two screws. And these ones aren't rusted in, so they should come out a little bit quicker. And they did. The other screws were rusty because, as I said, the camera had been popped down somewhere damp and that has the effect of causing steel screws to rust. Right, just take these pieces out. That's the transfer shaft. Here is the shroud. Now yeah, that little piece there, that bush there, and that's what fell out when I was getting that screw loose. It's D-shaped and it fits into the shroud from the inside and it's pressed in place. And you can unpress them with a hammer quite easily. Okay, so there's a camera body stripped right down. Here's the front shroud, front standard, etc. So I'll depress the button, slide that right through, making sure I catch the buttons and their springs on the way out. There's our shroud, this could be cleaned manually. This piece is called the sleeve, that is depressed by the shutter release shaft, and this piece in turn presses. This piece, which in turn releases the shutter on the sh shutter itself. Okay, that looks good. Let's have those two screws out. And this screw holds that spring in place, that return spring, which is a little bit misshapen in this case, but nothing serious. We'll pop that to one side with the screws. And that's my camera body all stripped down there. The parts to go in the degreaser are here. And the parts that I'll clean manually are the likes of things like this. And of course the rangefinder, meter and top cover and so forth. Right, so with that happening I'll put these pieces in the degreaser. Well that was fun while that's all whizzing around in the cleaner. Let's look at camera number two. This is the one where the shutter appears to be completely gummed up. But the shutter cocking rack less likely to be have failed. At least I hope that's the case. I'll take that shutter off. See what happens if I manually cock that. You 
No, it's really reluctant to go. There's one other thing I can try. This is a diagnostic technique, not to be confused to a repair because it's not a repair. I'm going to warm this shutter up with a hairdryer. I can see that the blades are very, very oily. What I expect to happen is that the oil will very much soften with the heat and the shutter may work again. Back shortly. Well, the diaphragm wouldn't even move until I've warmed it up. It's very, very oily. Let's see if the shutter will go now. The blades do not come back to the rest position. No, it's certainly cocked. Let's have a look inside. See if we can tell more. Carefully, carefully handling that tiny screw because they're easily lost. Using a toothpick to unscrew the retaining ring because if you use a metal tool, you'll end up scarring it. Lift off our setting rings. Lift off the shutter speed settings cam plate. Take that catch out. Take the pinion out. Let's unhook these, this curved rack. I'm just nudging this. This is the wheel here, the main cam, and as soon as I nudged it, the blades closed. We'll cock the shutter manually, see if it'll fire. It certainly does, but it's reluctant to return to the rest position. There's a great deal of stickiness there from the shutter blades and possibly from other parts of the mechanism. I'll strip the shutter down further, see if we can find out where the stickiness, it may just be in the blades, they are really oily. I'm going to unhook the spring here from the main cam and have a look at that. Now that's very tired, if you took that point as being the 12 o'clock that's at least at 4 o'clock on the other one, so that spring is, let's just say that its rest position is not in a useful place. The speed trains, what's that like? That appears to move freely enough. That screw's very tight, unusually so. Doesn't look like anyone's done anything odd like lock tightening it. We'll get this down to the point where there's nothing obstructing us but the action of the shutter blades and we'll have a better idea of what was causing our problem. This is the main cam when you the cam when the shutter's cocked, this is round in this position, held down by this latch. And this latch is lifted by the action of the release, freeing this piece up and allowing the cam to run round where it picks up the blade actuating ring, moves it in one direction, the B lever is dropped in there. If I hold the B lever back, this would continue its action. The other side of the cam picks up the other stud and brings this back to the rest position. And all that action is very, very stiff. You can hear a nasty buzzing noise in the distance, that's the ultrasonic cleaner. Busy working away industriously, shifting the grease off the body parts of the other camera.
see if I can get that spring loose. I really want a pair of pliers for this, but I might be able to achieve it with tweezers. Yes, I did. That lever off, that off. Now yeah, there's some springs here, some fine springs easily lost, so I've got to be very cautious about this. So I'll put a toothpick over the centre of that shift so the spring has got nowhere to go to, and unhook the end of it very carefully, and lift it out of the shutter. And its mate over here is much the same deal. Springs are only a nuisance when they're under tension. If you release the tension, you can handle them quite easily. That doesn't mean they won't ping away off your tweezers, but at least they're not high velocity missiles doing their best to get well away. Alright, let's have the shutter case off. And shortly we'll be able to get in and find out whether the Stiffness is due entirely to the shutter blades or whether the blade actuating ring is unusually sticky. I'm just removing this. these shims here are very greasy. This lever held by three screws holds the setting lever for the diaphragm in place. Now the diaphragm in this camera was effectively frozen in place. That oil on the blades was sticking them as well. Yeah, you can see lots of loose oil on there. That's a nasty, greasy looking piece of metal. Three screws hold the mechanism plate and the shutter case together. Usually they're uniformly tight. Let's go, here we go. So the shutter blade's lifted off, stuck to the plate here. This is, they're, they're just glued together with oil. You can see here, there's actually all puddles of oil here. Now that level of oil, there was no danger those shutter blades were ever going to work normally. Let's see if the blade actuating ring would actually move nicely. That cam off. Make sure everything's out of the way. That does move reasonably freely. So the, it was definitely just the blades. There wasn't a problem with the blade actuating ring. That was less than a hundred percent but it certainly wasn't stopping the shutter from working. What was stopping the shutter from working was the incredibly oily state of the shutter blades and the diaphragm blades which will be in exactly the same sort of condition. Since that oil will have come in from the back of the shutter I mean, that's, that's really greasy. Yeah, that's a nice little rosette of sticky blades there. Now, diaphragm blades, they will form a rosette, but they'll form a rosette that holds together when it's closed. These are in the open position. The only thing sticking this together is oil. So that was the problem with the shutter at least, it was oil on the blades. That's the oiliest shutter I've seen in a long time. At least the oiliest shutter where I don't immediately suspect that someone had poked an oil can in the front and given it a good squirt. I think this is um, a natural process, it's the illness of old age, not abuse. Right, for this shutter I'll have to clean all these pieces up.
and put this to one side. Meanwhile we might just as well have the body apart for camera number two since we've now stripped down the shutter and diagnosed that. And this is basically a rerun of what we've just done. I'll gather together some bins for these parts. This camera is slightly earlier production. It does not have chrome plated trims for the body edges top and bottom. It has polished alloy edges on the body itself. There were probably other differences between the two. One was the meter. The later camera had a, the ASA speeds on the meter went to ASA 650. On this one the speeds went to ASA 320. Let's have a look at the top cover. It's nice and clean inside. Not expecting any great problem with that. Let's have the body back, let's have the shutter release off and have that meter out. So with the meters, one being having a top rated film speed of 650 and the other one of 320. Is there likely to be any difference in the meters themselves? Probably not. It was probably just uh, a difference in the dials. The range finder, two screws, They certainly weren't any danger of rattling loose in a hurry. I'll put the range finder to one side. Strap lug on this end is bent, but it's bent the other way. This strap lug is bent outwards. Now when the strap lugs have bent out, been bent outwards, it doesn't indicate the camera's been dropped. It indicates that someone wanted to force through an unsuitably thick neck strap. It doesn't do wonders for the strap lugs because the, the cross section of those at the ends is quite thin and they're in danger of breaking. It's only chrome brass and it's not a... yeah it, it'll break. If you put enough force on it it'll certainly snap. Now I know it's been done by something like people forcing stuff through because the strap lug at this end has been done in the same fashion and I can see a crack propagating across the corner there and there I'm just seeing if I can see the same on this one yeah probably it's a weak spot any time you've got a sharp notch in a piece of metal that creates a place where things are likely to go from. Let's remove the screws from this shutter cocking rack and look at the state of this one. We know with this pair of cameras it looks like one of them is going to require a new cocking rack. Possibly. See what this mate is like. That looks quite good. That's very good. The shutter release. I'm just checking to see if it's got a return spring on it. It doesn't. It does have, this is a two piece. It's got a little sleeve on here. So that was a change in manufacturing practices. Let's have the spring off here. And unscrew the screw from the top of the release shaft and recover that spring. That's our adjustment for the point at which the 
film advance is released when you press the shutter release. In an ideal world, at exactly the same point in the travel of the shutter release, the shutter fires and the film advance is released to allow you to wind on to the next shot. We don't live in an ideal world, so getting that adjustment as good as you can is reasonably important. If you set it so that the film advance is released early in the stroke of the shutter release, occasionally you'll end up with a dead frame. And how you get those is that you, if you change your mind when you go to release the shutter, just before you fire the shutter, you change your mind and you let your finger back up, perhaps because the subject has moved or your expression's gone wrong or something of that nature. When you release, let your shutter release button back up, the, um, that's fine, except the film advance has now been released ready for the next shot. And so next time you pick up the camera and you go to move the film advance, it moves. Winds on to the next shot. Although the shutter is already cocked, you weren't aware of that. And as a result, you end up winding past an unexposed piece of film. Now, film's relatively cheap. So it's probably gone up, gone up again in price these days. It, but it's comparatively cheap and so it's not the end of the world having the odd piece of unexposed film. The opposite problem if you have it set so that the film is released the film advance is not released at the same point that the shutter fires. If the shutter fires first and you're doing exactly as you've been told to do of squeezing very gently on the shutter release until it fires and then you allow the button to come back up, you have fired the shutter but the film advance is not released to allow you to wind on to the next shot. And in that case, you're going to have to press the film release button each time in order to free up the film advance, which of course is an extra action, and it's very, very tedious. Now this leatherette, this could be a problem. And why I say that is that it looks very neat, it's not loose at all, and I know this is straight down on the aluminium body because there are no chrome, chrome brass trims here. So can I get this leatherette up is the next question. And even if I can, what sort of state is it going to be in? Now here, this is over a plate uh, of nickel plated steel. Now normally it's easier to get the leatherette off this piece than it is further back. What I've got to try and do is get under the leatherette so I can get my scalpel down at a shallow angle to peel it back. Yeah. It's 
looking at what's happening with this leather it it's stretching quite a bit just when I'm working in a narrow piece like this it's it's stretching and that's affecting the surface of the leather it the finish of it this one at all. Right, back in a minute I've just got to change those mechanical parts in the ultrasonic cleaner to a detergent wash now. <laughs> 